we will do it. So I will go black. I'll just. So everyone needs to switch off the video first. Yeah, I'm just yeah. going to stop my video. And then you can start broadcasting. I will make myself I'll mute. Start. Okay, I'll start broadcasting now. Yes, and please record as well, Franco. Yeah, it's recording. I saw I pressed recording oh. on cloud. Okay, all right, sure. Correct, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's on.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, event today. Um, I would like to welcome you in our event, and I would like to uh, invite our speaker, uh, Virginie Kolayuta, to uh, show her face. Uh, we have here uh, Virginie uh, today in our event. I'm trying to control the, uh, the slides. Norul, can you help me and take the control back? Today's event is the risk driving from ground conditions under the civil law and common law jurisdictions and the impact of new technologies. Before we start, I would like to uh, introduce the Charter Institute of Arbitrators to you. Uh, we have a branch here of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators under the uh, QFC. There is almost uh, approximately 200 CIR members in Qatar uh, presently. The Qatar uh, and QFC branch of the CIR was established in 2017 and now has an office in the uh, QFC Tower 2. Um, um, uh, adjunct to the Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center, QICDRC facilities. Um, uh, the Charter Institute of Arbitrators um, would like to thank um, uh, the branch sponsor and partners, the Qatar International Court uh, and Dispute Resolution Center and its CEO, uh, Faisal uh, Rashid Al Shahoudi. Next. I would like to present to you the branch committee, uh, Mr. Ahmed Ansari, the president. Uh, Matthew Walker, the Honorary Secretary, Mr. Abdul Rahman is the Vice President, and Tamam Al Akari is the um, Treasury. Uh, Katrina uh, is the Governance Director, shown and shown uh, for the education. Nikas. Norul Sabri for events. Uh, Adi Mahmoud is the young member, and three or four uh, new uh, appointed members, Pamela McDonald. Uh, Stephen Robertson and uh, Anil and Muhammad Alalian. So the event today will be presenting uh, Virginie uh, uh, Kulayuta uh, as a partner of LMS. Please next. Hello. Hi Virginie. Virginie is the partner of the London office of LMS Legal. She acts as a counsel, advocates, and arbitrator in the international arbitration proceeding, uh, di uh, uh, diving from construction and energy projects. Also based in uh, uh, bilateral and uh, multilateral investment treaties. Uh, Virginie uh, is admitted to practice in England and Wales, solicitor, and in New York as uh, USA as attorney in, at law, and in France as um, avo avocat à la court. Uh, as a result of her qualification uh, and experience, she has an excellent understanding of the differences between civil law and common law rules um, applicable to construction and the injury dispute. Uh, Virginie also teach uh, at the Construction Law Center of King's College, London, and is the chair of the editorial board of the Law Magazine Construction Law International, a publication of the International Construction Projects Committee uh, of the International Power Association. Uh, Virginie is finally a, a current member of the executive board of the Italian uh, Society of the Construction Law. Uh, Virginie also is considered a tough leader by who is who's legal uh, and is recommended as an expert by the legal uh, 500. Next. So uh, to organize, uh, 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 Virginie will be presenting her presentation first. Uh, then we will give the floor to uh, Mr. Ahmed Lansari to uh, give his word. Uh, then we will follow it with the uh, questions and the answer. So please, uh, if you have any questions, keep it to the end and use the uh, Q&A or uh, send it to the chat uh, through to the panelists. And we, at the end of the uh, presentation, we will start uh, answering all the questions. The, this session is recorded and the recording will be shared to the, our social media and we will send it to uh, everyone. Uh, in addition, uh, also the slides will be shared uh, with whoever we, uh, uh, will ask for it. So please welcome uh, Virginie, and uh, Virginie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Saad. Um, I will uh, share my screen uh, with my uh, presentation. Um, here it is. I hope uh, you are able to see uh, my slides. Um, uh, as uh, Saad said, uh, 
we are uh, discussing today um, the uh, differences uh, between uh, uh, civil law and common law uh, in relation to uh, contractors' liability with respect to unforeseeable grant conditions, or more generally, uh, to whatever uh, liability a contractor might have uh, with respect to uh, grant condition in general. Uh, there are some differences uh, among countries uh, of uh, the civil law uh, world, and there are many differences uh, among the countries uh, which belong to the common law uh, tradition. So for that reason, uh, this presentation will focus in order to make uh, a, a thorough analysis of uh, whatever differences uh, exist uh, between two emblematic uh, um, uh, jurisdictions for civil law and uh, the common law tradition. And for that purpose, I have uh, taken uh, two jurisdictions uh, with which I am uh, uh, quite acquainted, um, well acquainted, uh, that is uh, the uh, France, that is uh, French law, and uh, England and Wales, so English law. Um, as Saad has explained, I am an English solicitor, uh, qualified uh, um, in England and Wales, and also a French avocat à cour uh, since several years, and practicing in construction law. So for that reason, I hope that uh, whatever I'm going to explain <laughs> is uh, reliable for your understanding and uh, comprehension of, of the issues. So the very first uh, difference uh, that we need uh, to address is uh, the fact that uh, under French law, the rules are mostly embedded in the statutory rules. So the very, the very first difference is there is a clear provision in the law in Article 1792 of the French Civil Code that defines a starting point about the relevance of uh, defects relating to grant conditions uh, for the contractors. And, uh, and we will see uh, what actually uh, the definition of the uh, law um, the statutory rule of Article 1792 refers to when uh, it refers to builders. Because in fact, uh, the version, the, the uh, word builder does not refer necessarily and exclusively to contractors. So the basic um, is that uh, any builder of a work is liable uh, towards the building owner or purchaser for damages resulting from a defect of the ground which imperil the solidity of the construction or which by affecting it in one of its constituent parts or its equipment items, uh, render it unfit for its purposes. So such liability does not take place where the builder proves that the damages were caused by an extraneous event. And we will see what, what it means uh, to have an external, external event that uh, exonerates the liability of the builder. Um, for purposes of completeness, every time I uh, refer to a particular statutory rule, obviously I include also the French uh, version, not because uh, I expect everyone uh, to be able to read it, but only to make sure that uh, whoever is able to can exactly uh, see uh, the original version. So what does it mean, a builder under Article 1792? Uh, it means uh, any architect, contractor, technician or other person bound to the building owner by a construction contract, or any person who sells uh, after completion a construction which he has uh, built or had built by others, or any person who, even though acting as an agent of the owner of the construction, completed a mission similar to that of a service contractor. So that means that the liability 
that is defined in Article 1792, which is a mandatory liability, uh, refers not only to a contractor, but also to the architect or to any technician or any other person who has, in fact, um, um, built, I mean, uh, uh, is bound uh, as a result of a construction contract uh, uh, towards uh, the owner. Um, so what we have seen is that the liability of the architect for defects resulting from grant conditions um, exists under the Article 1792. So the, the, the activities that are usually are um, exerted by an architect uh, is, uh, the, are the activities relating to the design, the conception of uh, uh, the uh, construction project. Um, under French law, uh, the liability of the architect uh, is, is excluded uh, when his contractual obligation was limited to obtaining a construction permit. But uh, uh, when the damages are the result of a design error, the contractor can be held nevertheless liable in a decision dated 29 October 2008, rendered by the Paris Court of Appeal, so that uh, uh, the Court of Appeal decided that considering that the design error of the architect does not represent an extraneous cause susceptible to exonerate the liability of the contractor to comply with its own obligation to, uh, to respect, in fact, to build the construction according to the standard rules. That means the uh, règle de art. That means uh, the standard way of building, um, of uh, actually um, providing the construction services uh, that, uh, and, and to perform the works uh, for which uh, there was a promise. So remember, um, as we have seen, that uh, Article 1792 makes, um, uh, defines the liability uh, in relation to any characteristics of the ground, because we cannot speak really of the facts of the ground, because the ground is what it is. Um, this liability exists only with respect to um, those characteristics that are able to, uh, that may impact the solidity of the structural building uh, that has been realized or affects it in one of its constituent part or equipment items um, or makes the construction unfit for its purposes. So um, when we have uh, an architect uh, that uh, defines the design and there is an error and there is a contractor that performs uh, uh, the construction, uh, there is a, uh, nevertheless a responsibility of the contractor in performing the works, uh, despite uh, the existence of the error. And uh, what happens is uh, that um, in this particular case, uh, I mean, in this uh, uh, case of uh, coexistence of liability, uh, the judge can in fact uh, um, attribute a degree of uh, of liability to both uh, the architect and the contractor. But the reason the contractor uh, remains liable and is because uh, um, it does have uh, uh, an obligation, a uh, duty to advise the owner and the client for any um, uh, necessary um, impact that uh, any serious impact uh, that uh, uh, the design errors uh, that uh, he might uh, see uh, could have on the construction. So the result of the article 1792 is that uh, uh, the consequence is the implication uh, for the contractor um, and for the architect or for whoever is uh, 
uh, falls within the definition of a builder uh, is the obligation to um, um, perform the survey and the study that are necessary uh, to ensure the solidity of uh, and the fitness for purpose of the construction, uh, according to Article 1792. And the same obligation is imposed on the contractor as uh, um, also in the event of a construction uh, performed on a pre-existing construction. But this is true only if the renovation works are not marginal and, uh, and are structurally uh, important. That is, uh, they impact, in fact, the structure of the construction. Uh, given the mandatory content of Article 1792 of the French Civil Code, the parties can therefore negotiate and agree the allocation of the cost of the works that would be necessary as a result of unforeseeable, unforeseen ground conditions. But they cannot negotiate the exclusion of liabilities, which are mandatorily defined by Article 1792. Um, an example of uh, uh, what uh, would represent uh, a work uh, um, or liability of a builder, uh, according to the definition of the French uh, uh, Article 1792, uh, for making a particular construction as unfit for purpose, is uh, uh, the existence, for example, of pollution, which is uh, often discovered uh, in the case of earthworks and would not typically affect the solidity of uh, the construction, but may affect the aptitude of a construction to be fit for its purposes. And we will see how um, this uh, uh, same uh, problem uh, relating to um, the ground uh, has been treated under English law later on, on a recent decision rendered by English courts. So the reason uh, why we can imply uh, that uh, there is uh, an obligation to, uh, or an implied uh, um, interest for the uh, builder or the contractor in particular uh, to uh, make, uh, to acquire the necessary knowledge about the characteristics of the ground in order to avoid uh, his own liability under Article 1792 is also deriving from the fact that uh, he has a duty to advise his client and employer. And when that duty to advise is not fulfilled, uh, the contractor can be uh, held liable. So that's why he needs to do the necessary, to undertake the necessary inquiries, uh, uh, to express the relevant observations, uh, make the necessary reservations, uh, and, could, and uh, undertake, in fact, a minimal um, verification to ensure that the works are feasible, even when uh, uh, he must rely on, uh, on the ground survey uh, provided uh, and data in general provided by the employer. Um, Contractors have a duty to advise the client, even when acting on the instruction of an expert or an architect or an engineer. And, uh, and it, in certain circumstances, uh, the contractor must even refuse to perform when the construction works uh, would uh, um, lead uh, as uh, um, defined uh, uh, by the design that he received, uh, or uh, for other reasons, uh, to its own liability. And, uh, and this is especially uh, true when uh, the instruction uh, received is dangerous uh, or exceeds the contractor's uh, capacity. Uh, otherwise, uh, he would incur in uh, his own liability uh, under the Article 1792. Within the context of uh, the administrative uh, uh, contracts, uh, there are some escapes uh, to the liability uh, for at least for the cost 
um, that uh, the contractor may incur as a result of unforeseen gang conditions. So until now, we have seen the general rule. And uh, let's see what actually are the, uh, uh, the solutions for the contractors. Uh, as I said, uh, the contractor cannot escape his liability, but uh, can at least uh, um, negotiate the allocation of uh, the cost that may derive from unforeseen gun conditions. In under French law, uh, which is uh, common also in most uh, civil law jurisdictions, there is a separation between uh, uh, contracts and the law, the administrative law, and the law that applies to private entities. Um, administrative law applies to uh, most uh, uh, contracts for public works, which are concluded with state entities, or for works that are uh, for the uh, main uh, benefit of uh, the uh, of the society, um, and uh, so they are considered, in fact, uh, global. I mean, uh, major national infrastructure projects. Uh, for that reason, uh, administrative law would apply, nevertheless. Sometimes the distinction between administrative law and uh, and private law is uh, blurring. Uh, so it would need uh, a, really a, a construction and a specific interpretation to decide whether in fact the contract is submitted to administrative law or not for certain aspects. For those contracts in any event, uh, that are contracts for public works, uh, under French law, uh, there is a specific theory, uh, which is called the Théorie des suggestions imprévues, where the parties, uh, um, if they have not negotiated an express clause for contractual allocation of cost, uh, may allow to the contractor uh, under certain circumstances uh, to full compensation for the loss caused by unforeseen ground conditions, including cost for additional works. And the conditions must be unforeseen, uh, abnormal, and affected, uh, unaffected by the will of the parties. For uh, private parties in, instead, uh, there is another principle that can be invoked by the builders uh, and in specifically by the contractors, uh, which is a principle that has been uh, uh, included uh, in the uh, French civil code uh, since uh, the new reform in 2016 and the 1st October 2016, uh, which is reproduced by Article 1195. And that's the principle of uh, hardship, uh, which is uh, uh, called in French, imprévision. And that relates to a change of circumstances uh, that were unforeseeable at the time of the conclusion of the contract, which uh, renders performance of the contract excessively, excessively onerous for one of the parties that had not accepted the risk of such a change. And that party may ask the renegotiation of uh, the other party, the renegotiation of the contract. Um, if uh, there is no agreement, they can agree to, for example, uh, submit to the uh, judge, uh, a court or a tribunal, uh, to decide how to adapt uh, the, uh, uh, the contract. Or uh, if uh, there is uh, no agreement, uh, finally, uh, under the request, uh, as per the request of one of the parties, uh, a court or a tribunal may either amend the contract or terminate the contract. The concept of hardship uh, does not uh, um, have any recognition in uh, um, England and Wales. So unless uh, there is a contractual clause that is included in the contract, um, a contractor uh, which, who is part of a, a, a contract uh, submitted to English law would not have uh, by default uh, the protection that comes from Article 1195. Uh, instead, um, such article and uh, the possibility of invoking hardship 
uh, is possible uh, if the contract is submitted to French law and the parties have not excluded the application of such article. Uh, because in fact, uh, it's an implied term uh, of the contract that doesn't need uh, to be negotiated and derives uh, its application as a result of the fact that the contract is submitted to French law. Um, so uh, this article applies only to contracts uh, concluded after 1st of October 2016, which is the date uh, uh, of the reform of the civil code in France. And uh, as I said, uh, the parties uh, can uh, negotiate uh, the, its, its exclusion. And, and whenever uh, that article is not excluded, uh, what it needs, uh, they need to demonstrate, uh, the affected party needs, uh, needs to demonstrate, uh, is the existence of uh, uh, excessive economic imbalance uh, between the two um, contractual uh, obligations of the parties, so that uh, uh, that imbalance makes uh, the obligation of one of the parties uh, to be extremely onerous. Uh, but to give you an idea of what can represent uh, an excessive onerous uh, imbalance uh, uh, in the contract, uh, you need to know that, for instance, uh, in a uh, case in 2015, uh, the increase, uh, actually, the, the, the increase of, uh, um, of cost uh, to be paid uh, um, to suppliers, uh, which uh, corresponded to um, a reduction of the margin of the, of, uh, the affected party's gross margin of 60%, was uh, uh, decided not to constitute uh, an excessive uh, onerous uh, um, in this, an excessive generosity that would justify the application of the principle of imprevision. In general, under French law, uh, the obligation of a contractor uh, is uh, considered under two uh, regimes, uh, two regimes um, of rules, uh, two different kinds of rules. Uh, typically, a construction contract uh, is a, a contract where a part, the contractor has an obligation um, to a committed result, which uh, means uh, an obligation de résultat, uh, which uh, is uh, distinct from the obligation de moyen, um, that is opposed to an obligation to provide uh, generic uh, or general services uh, or supply materials. The distinction between two different, two di these two different regimes is uh, uh, the fact that uh, when there is an obligation de résultat, so that means uh, the contractor has uh, an obligation to a committed result, he must deliver that result. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, he is liable for not, having um, for not having provided that result, uh, which was promised in the contract. And instead, uh, if uh, uh, his contract was an obligation de moyen, uh, so providing just uh, general uh, services or supplies and materials, uh, his obligations uh, is, uh, his liability is um, uh, defined by his uh, um, by best effort kind of standard. So there are two different uh, standards. And obviously having a, an obligation de résultat, it's a quite high standard. And uh, the contractor would be immediately rely, uh, liable if uh, uh, it didn't, uh, uh, it didn't uh, deliver the committed result. And that uh, is uh, also with respect uh, to the existence of uh, uh, grant conditions. So as a result of this general principle, whereby the contractor is obliged to deliver that committed result, also any kind of characteristics relating to uh, the grant conditions would fall um, uh, by default within the liability of the contractor. However, the contractor's liability is not without limits. We have seen that uh, if there is an extraneous uh, uh, cause, 
the contractors can be exonerated uh, uh, by his, uh, uh, of his liability. And this uh, can uh, be the case when there is a situation of force majeure event, or when, for example, uh, the employer has deliberately uh, accepted the risks affecting the uh, construction as a result of the ground conditions, of which obviously the employer was uh, aware. Uh, we have also seen that uh, the uh, errors in the design um, uh, as a result of uh, the design conceived by the architect does not constitute, uh, um, according to the French courts, an extraneous, uh, this, uh, an extraneous cause uh, which would exonerate uh, uh, the contractor. Um, another reason, in fact, is the force majeure. Uh, we have seen, for example, an earthquake uh, exonerates the uh, liability of a contractor. Uh, uh, the definition of force majeure under French law is uh, given by Article 1218 of the French Civil Code and uh, refers to an event beyond the control of the debtor which could not reasonably have been foreseen at the time of the conclusion of the contract and whose effects cannot be avoided by appropriate measures. Uh, to, and, and when such an event uh, takes place, which prevents uh, the performance uh, of uh, uh, the contract's obligation, uh, then uh, there is a uh, um, in fact, uh, the possibility for the contractor to uh, be exonerated uh, from any uh, liability. The concept uh, um, of force majeure or is uh, known also under English law, but uh, it doesn't correspond to any uh, statutory uh, rule. Uh, so in order to have uh, that kind of uh, uh, principle applicable uh, in um, under English law, the parties will have to have negotiated uh, the uh, um, the existence of uh, force majeure uh, events and uh, the uh, terms and conditions for its application. Um, under French law, um, if there is not a specific clause included and uh, negotiated by the parties in their contract. Um, the parties can nevertheless rely on the uh, definition given uh, by the statutes, and that means by Article 1218 uh, of the French Civil Code. Um, so what are the three elements uh, for having a force majeure event? Is uh, the element of exteriority, uh, that means beyond the affected party's control, and uh, that is uh, um, the event uh, that does not result uh, by uh, conduct or acts uh, of the affected party. Uh, the, pre the aspect of uh, unforeseeability, so that uh, could not be for reasonably foreseen at the time of conclusion of the contract, and then irresistibility, uh, that means that uh, there are no, there were not measures, uh, appropriate measures that they could have taken, uh, could have been uh, taken uh, by uh, the uh, affected party in order to event, to prevent uh, the event to uh, make uh, his obligation uh, impossible. And uh, the way those uh, appropriate measures are defined uh, are with respect to uh, in abstracto, so with respect to uh, theoretical. Uh, behavior that uh, an average person in the same circumstances uh, would have uh, um, adopted in order to, uh, to prevent any, uh, the event to take place. And even if the performance of those uh, um, measures would be costly, uh, French law tended to uh, um, deny uh, the defense of force majeure uh, if uh, they have not been taken by the affected party. Uh, parties can agree to limit uh, and exclude uh, their liability. And it's important to see how this is possible under French law. 
um, a, the contractor can exclude, uh, for example, uh, its liability for indirect and consequential losses, including loss of business uh, or profits. But uh, the exclusion is not uh, valid if a party is guilty of gross negligence, uh, that means uh, foot lured, or uh, willful misconduct, uh, that is dull. Uh, the exclusion of uh, liability is too broad and uh, thus insignificant. If there is a, such an exclusion, uh, French law denies uh, the application of uh, that particular clause because would make uh, the contractual obligation and commitment of uh, uh, the contractual party uh, inexistent in, in essence. And so for that reason, uh, any exclusion that makes uh, uh, such a contractual performance, a contractual performance uh, um, insignificant or inexistent uh, would uh, be considered as not written. And then uh, liability is excluded um, is instead uh, defined by public uh, um, policy uh, in specific uh, cases uh, in three, um, in, with respect to three uh, basic warranties that uh, the contractor um, provides uh, as per the law. And that is uh, uh, in relation to a one-year warranty, la garantie de parfait achèvement, uh, which applies to all defects uh, indicated by the employer uh, within one year after the end over. Um, then the guarantee biennale, uh, that is a two year warranty, which applies to all defects uh, affecting separable equipment, which can be detached from the main construction without damaging the latter or being damaged. And then the decennial warranty, which exists uh, also in Qatar, for instance, as far as I know, <laughs> uh, which applies uh, to defects that compromise the solidity of the construction and uh, or makes it unfit for its purposes. Um, the uh, uh, liability, uh, the 10 year liability um, is uh, in fact connected with uh, that article 1792, which we have seen, uh, which makes in fact um, the liability also defined in terms of a specific warranty uh, that is mandatory defined under French law. And, uh, and this aspect, the public policy warranties that are imposed on contractors are uh, expressly provided by law uh, under Article 1792-5, which says, in fact, uh, which refers to these particular articles that we have seen, uh, which are highlighted here on the slide uh, for your um, easier um, identification. And uh, that, in fact, makes uh, impossible for the contractor to shorten the period or to shorten uh, or to reduce the scope of uh, those liabilities uh, because they are considered public policy liabilities under the, the under French law. Under English law, what happens? Uh, because we do not have uh, statutory rules. Uh, that apply to contracts uh, uh, as implied terms, uh, the relationship uh, between the contractor and the employer is mainly defined uh, by the contract, by the negotiated clauses. Um, so the, nevertheless, there are two basic uh, um, principles uh, or standard of performance uh, that exists under English law, which refer to the general principles of a duty to act with reasonable skill and care. Uh, that is, uh, um, it is sufficient if a contractor exercises the ordinary skill of an ordinary competent man exercising that particular art. And the uh, standard of the fitness for purpose, which is a higher duty uh, for the contractor 
um, of uh, the breach of which uh, does not require proof of negligence. And uh, unless uh, otherwise agreed, a fitness for purpose obligation will often be implied where a contractor is also responsible for the design of the building, uh, but not necessarily when uh, uh, the design was not uh, uh, the result of the contractor uh, work. Uh, but it's not uh, excluded nevertheless. Um, so the, um, under English law, uh, we saw um, that uh, force majeure is not a standalone notion uh, in English law. And unless otherwise agreed, uh, performance of the contract will only be excused uh, on account of unexpected circumstances, such as uh, ground conditions, if they fall within the limited doctrine of frustration, which is uh, um, a, a typical principle and uh, um, concept of, of under English law. And the frustrating event is uh, an event which uh, occurs after the conclusion of the contract, is uh, so essential that it distorts the contract beyond what was contemplated by the parties at the time of the conclusion of the contract, uh, is not due to the fault of either party and makes the performance of the contract impossible, illegal or substantially different from what was contemplated by the parties. And these criteria are very strict. And in practice, they are very difficult uh, to prove. And for that reason, uh, frustration is uh, rarely applied uh, in order to excuse the um, uh, performance uh, uh, under English law. Let's see uh, some cases. Uh, that uh, um, are um, under English law that uh, can in fact uh, uh, is, uh, explain um, the application of uh, the uh, contractual, contractor's liability under English law. So this is a case of uh, cooperative group uh, versus uh, John Allen Associates. Uh, it relates uh, to a supermarket site uh, which was built uh, for a group of retailers and the main contract provided for soil improvement by vibro compaction. Uh, the specifications were um, prepared by uh, a consulting firm, uh, engineering consulting firm, JA. And when preparing uh, its specifications, JA relied on the advice uh, of a subcontractor specializing on vibration replacement techniques, um, that is uh, Keller Limited. After the work was completed, uh, cracks in the flooring appeared in the supermarket, uh, which were proven to have been caused by an inadequate floor improvement. And the employer uh, therefore claimed damages uh, for, from JA for breach of uh, warranty. And the court found that JA uh, did not fail uh, to exercise reasonable care and skill as the expert evidence revealed, it could not be said that vibro replacement techniques would never have worked on site. So specifically the court uh, stated, and I'm reading for you, construction uh, professionals do not by the mere act of obtaining advice or design from another party, thereby divest themselves of their duties in respect of that, of that advice or design. Construction professionals can discharge their duty to take reasonable care by relying on the advice or design of a specialist provided, by they, uh, provided that they act reasonably in doing so. So the judge stated, I do not consider that vibro replacement could never have worked on the site or was inevitably going to fail so that the building was bound to suffer from extensive and unacceptable differential settlement. In that respect, I do not consider that vibro replacement was an inappropriate choice, nor do I consider that no reasonably competent engineer would have recommended vibro replacement or that JAA was negligent 
in recommending um, vibro replacement. So I find that JA were entitled to and did reasonably rely on the advice of Keller Limited as a contractor with specialist expertise in vibro replacement techniques and were not under duty to undertake an independent evaluation of the feasibility and risks of vibro replacement nor to recommend that geotechnical advice uh, should be sought from a consultant other than a specialist subcontractor. So why I chose this case uh, in order to, uh, for today is because uh, uh, the um, uh, analysis that we are conducting uh, that I was hoping to um, express, uh, I mean, uh, illustrate to you today was uh, um, not only in terms of uh, defining the difference uh, between French and English uh, rules applicable to um, uh, characteristics of the ground conditions uh, that can affect the construction, but also the relevance of uh, uh, new technologies uh, and how these new technologies uh, can affect uh, the allocation of liability uh, between the contractor uh, and the uh, um, employer and uh, eventually, in fact, uh, the uh, service, uh, the, the um, consulting firm providing the services relating to the use of new technologies. Um, another case uh, that uh, defines uh, um, the uh, relevance, I mean, how English law, um, the approach of English law with respect to uh, to ground condition and uh, the definition of when uh, the characteristics of uh, ground conditions uh, can be considered as uh, foreseeable or unforeseeable is uh, the OHL case. So Brasco and Huarte Lane uh, uh, contracted with uh, uh, the government of Gibraltar uh, to design and construct a road around the perimeter of uh, Gibraltar Airport, including some tunneling works. The contract was uh, based on the FIDIC yellow book conditions, and, uh, and there was a, a contaminated land desk study, which was provided uh, to bidders, uh, which delimited, they described uh, which were the areas uh, that had um, been contaminated uh, as a result of the, uh, of the war in that particular uh, area. Uh, OHL, when uh, they encountered uh, uh, contaminated soil in the areas uh, that were not indicated in the study, they stopped working. Um, and uh, six months later, the government of Gibraltar terminated the contract uh, because uh, OHL's fail failure to progress in the work and its compliance uh, for with a non-compliance with a notice uh, uh, to correct uh, issued by the government uh, of Gibraltar. So on the first instance uh, uh, court uh, case, uh, the judge Akenhead uh, stab, uh, established that the contaminants encountered uh, were reasonably foreseeable at the date of tender, even though they were not specifically indicated in the study, and the amount of uh, the contaminant uh, uh, which was reasonably foreseeable could exceed uh, the 10,000 uh, uh, cube, me cube meter um, provided in the environmental statement, uh, which was uh, uh, communicated to the bidders. And in particular, the quantities uh, actually encountered and present were likely to have been less than what uh, than what could have been reasonably foreseen by an experienced contractor. And it has certainly not been established otherwise. So the government of Gibraltar properly terminated the contract under clause 15 of the FIDI conditions following OHL's uh, failure to proceed with the works. In appeal, uh, OHL appealed the case, uh, the decision, and the appeal unanimously um, dismissed uh, the um, appeal made by, filed by OHL, uh, stating that the contamination was reasonably foreseeable. And in particular, the contractor uh, should draw 
uh, upon its own expertise and its experience of previous uh, civil engineering projects. Um, the contractor must make a reasonable assessment of the physical conditions which it may encounter um, and cannot simply accept someone else's interpretation of the data and say that is all what uh, is uh, foreseeable. The Court of Appeal uh, um, accepted, in fact, the, the finding of the lower court uh, by stating that the contractor needed to make provision for a possible worst case scenario and uh, should have made allowance for a proper investigation and removal of all contaminated material. So this decision uh, implies for a contractor to go beyond uh, the information provided by the employer. And, uh, and this, has, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, approach that uh, uh, was uh, decided in the Obraskan case was uh, further confirmed in a further case uh, in Van Hoord uh, case, where Van Hoord made a disruption and prolongation claims against all seas, uh, UK Limited, in relation to the construction of a third 30-inch uh, uh, gas export pipeline in the Shetland Islands. Uh, Article 223 of the contract required the contractor to provide a notice if it encountered uh, unforeseen subsurface uh, um, um, conditions. And the court held that an experienced contractor must consider that uh, more adverse conditions may exist uh, that have not been tested. And in particular, it is for an experienced contractor to fill in the gaps and take an informed decision as to what the likely conditions uh, would be overall. And uh, the judge stated, uh, in my view, it is wrong in principle uh, that uh, a contractor to, for a contractor to argue that merely because in some particular locations, uh, the conditions were different to those uh, set out in the pre-contract information, those different conditions uh, must somehow have been unforeseeable. Uh, so a further decision, this is a recent decision in the PBS uh, Energo against Vester Generation UK Limited. Um, uh, the same principle has been uh, uh, reiterated. Uh, this was a case uh, uh, um, about the allocation of risk uh, for ground conditions. Uh, the employer hired the contractor um, to engineer, procure, and construct a, a biomass power plant in Wales. And the contract was based on the FIDIC 99, 1999 Silver Book. Um, the uh, contract provided that the employer would make available to the contractor uh, all relevant data relating to uh, the ground conditions. And clause 410 of the contract provided that uh, the condition of the site should be the sole responsibility of the contractor and the contractor is uh, deemed to have obtained for itself uh, all necessary information as to risks, uh, contingencies and all other circumstances which may affect the works. Uh, the remaining of defects and the selection of uh, technology and save where otherwise set out in this contract, uh, the contractor accepts entire responsibility for investigating and ascertaining the conditions of the site. Uh, the uh, background was that the data uh, provided for the employer showed uh, that uh, asbestos uh, was not only present on the construction site, but also uh, found in the ground. The contractor sought to obtain an, an extension of time, but the employer uh, refused. And the construction project was not completed and both parties sought to, uh, to terminate the contract and claimed uh, damages. And the court ruled in favor of uh, the uh, employer, stating that the contractor took the risk for ground conditions 
and that uh, the discovery of uh, additional asbestos on site was not unforeseeable. Um, so um, the, uh, this case um, is uh, actually um, very similar uh, to some extent uh, to what you would have uh, under French law under the uh, article 1792, uh, which we have referred to at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, and the problem um, here that uh, these examples uh, uh, have uh, shown is uh, um, the uh, level of uh, disputes that uh, the uh, ground conditions can uh, in fact uh, raise uh, between the contractor and the employer. So it is a good news that uh, uh, with new technologies, the, these disputes uh, can maybe be reduced uh, because uh, uh, some new technologies allow to have a better understanding of the subsurface and eventually reduce uh, the risks uh, for uh, unforeseeable characteristics of the ground for both the employer and the contractors. And there are some new technologies uh, that uh, are now um, starting to be uh, um, used. Uh, one is the electromagnetic induction, uh, which uses an electrical current uh, to create a magnetic uh, uh, field. And it's particularly useful in uh, environments, uh, environments where conventional method uh, would be hindered by high moisture soil. Uh, the ground penetrating radar, uh, which emits uh, uh, directional electromagnetic uh, waves and uses the, the uh, signal return uh, to identify where subsurface uh, utility infrastructure is located, um, and uh, which is used uh, to, for utility mapping. But these are not uh, the only one, uh, the only technologies that exist. Um, some uh, new technologies, for example, some infrared uh, uh, radars uh, and um, uh, scanning um, uh, are used with uh, the use of drones, uh, um, which uh, make, uh, uh, which make, in fact, uh, accessible areas and places um, too uh, difficult to be reached with uh, traditional um, uh, man-made, man-controlled um, uh, I mean, controlled, uh, vehicles um, instead of uh, drones. Uh, the problem about uh, the use of uh, new technologies is uh, how they can affect the allocation of risks. And uh, to the extent that uh, in, under French law, there is an obligation de résultat. That means that the contractor is uh, committed to, uh, to deliver a specific result. Um, it implies to some extent uh, the fact that uh, the cost of these new technologies would uh, fall within uh, the, uh, uh, the contractor in order to limit its own risks. And uh, as, for under, under, as for the English law instead, because there are no rules about uh, uh, the allocation of risks uh, that may derive from uh, the use of these new technologies. Uh, everything uh, boils down to what, in fact, the parties will negotiate uh, among themselves. And uh, they are not, for the moment, any kind of uh, contractual um, standard rules uh, that uh, um, exist. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, some of these uh, um, contractual clauses are being developed and uh, um, some new approaches are, for instance, to um, have uh, conducting, uh, to have a ground survey conducted through contractual agreements with subcontractors, uh, which are specialized uh, third party operators. And in this particular case, the third party um, uh, would be bound by indemnification and general coverage insurance uh, and other specific contractual provisions. So any kind of uh, uh, error in the, um, um, in the uh, 
analysis and the data that derive from this, uh, the use of these new technologies would be in fact uh, placed over the operator, uh, the, the subcontractor providing the services. Uh, some standard contractual clauses are beginning to emerge, as I was saying, aiming at providing specific contractual conditions uh, which are tailored uh, to the use of these new technologies on construction sites. And uh, for instance, uh, for the use of drones, uh, there is a now uh, uh, often used model drone services agreement, uh, which is uh, um, uh, quite often used for, for these kind of uh, services. So I hope you had uh, a very um, uh, interesting uh, um, understanding or session of uh, uh, these issues and um, I'm uh, open for uh, your questions if you have any. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Virginie, for uh, this talk. But before we go to the questions, uh, I would like to invite uh, Ahmed Ansari, our uh, chapter uh, president, uh, who is also the technical director at Ajgal, to uh, give us some insights about the, because you spoke about the risk allocation and the contracts and stuff like that. So I know that Ajgal already have uh, or are developing some kind of uh, forms. So I'd like to invite Ahmed, if he is here, to give us his commentary on the uh, on these kind of uh, contracts. Thanks, Ad. I'm here. Uh, uh, could you uh, put my video on, please? Yes. Yeah, it's on now. Okay. Can everybody see me now? Yes, yes. and it's good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks, Virginie. Uh, what an interesting talk. Uh, well, I'd like uh, to thank Virginia for the talk. Uh, Virginia and I met uh, almost five years ago in England, and ever since we uh, keep continuing uh, meeting and exchanging information. And there is a good collaboration between uh, the two of us. Uh, it was in Cambridge. Uh, do you remember? Yeah, that's that, that, that's right. We met in Cambridge. Uh, yeah. yeah, on that particular course. Uh, you know, the ground, the physical ground, and uh, unforeseen physical ground condition has always been uh, problematic in the reconstruction industry, to be honest. And uh, <clears throat> based on that, basically, within Ashgal, we decide the way forward on building the procurement strategy and method of contracting, basically. Okay. Nonetheless, I must uh, admit that we do have many problems uh, with that, especially when it comes to the condition contracts, where we as a client do not uh, take very much risk of that. Although we have come up with a new suite of contracts back in 2018, there are still some uh, you know, pitfalls and uh, uh, you know, drawbacks in uh, our conditions, where under the traditional uh, way of contracting, for instance, for instance we only accept uh, the ability for uh, time, but uh, we don't pay cost in case the underground conditions uh, happen to be not in line with what has been designed, for instance, or what the solar investigation results uh, uh, came out with. Uh, similarly, uh, if we go to a design and uh, contracts, for instance, uh, we uh, most probably do not accept uh, any uh, the abilities. Uh, some, some, some risks are shared, uh, some risks are contractors' risks, and some risk, risks are HGAR risks, but uh, I must say, most of the risks related to time extension rather than paying for any additional cost or overhead and profit for uh, contractors. And this is very much, not very much uh, popular within the local construction industry and other. Anyway, one of the conditions in uh, our traditional contracts uh, uh, says, uh, uh, you know, the contractor shall be deemed to have inspected and examine uh, the site and its surroundings and information available in connection with the site and its surroundings and to have satisfied itself as to all matters which may affect the design, executions and completion uh, of the works and the performance of the maintenance services, including, and this is the most dangerous part for contractors, uh, to form uh, and nature thereof, including ground and soil and hydrological uh, conditions. Unfortunately, during tendering stage, contractors are not giving the liberty uh, to uh, perform any site investigation work, for instance. Uh, they might be permitted to visit construction sites uh, or a project sites, may I say, but uh, 
uh, they won't be allowed to provide any kind of testing. There's going to be additional cost to them. And not many contractors will be interested to incur additional costs just for the sake of doing some grand uh, uh, or soil investigations, for instance, to uh, do proper estimations. Uh, so uh, contractors take most of the risk in that uh, uh, respect. So uh, we are currently re-examining this condition, to be honest, and I try to come up with a better understanding and make the picture much more clearer for contractors uh, when it comes to pricing their jobs. And uh, because some of the work in the past became uh, uh, frustrated and some of them impossible to complete due to unforeseen ground conditions where cavities were found, the huge cavities that needed to be filled with some mass concreting, including huge cost to some contractors. And there was a big debate over it whether it was a mistake of Ashkal due to poor, <laughs> poor solar investigation reports. Or was it the contractor being experienced? Contractor should have made, made, made himself uh, familiarized with the site conditions. I personally do not agree with that because the soil and the ground conditions here in Qatar vary from place to uh, another. Some of them, the strata, the uh, bearing capacities are quite high, strong, and elsewhere where the results come up with uh, good strata and good bearing capacities, but on, physically on the ground, it's, uh, it's not. Uh, we've been through many uh, disputes over there, uh, over this, uh, these issues, and definitely it's the time for us to rectify those uh, problems. It's either we say 100% is the contractor's reliability by doing turnkey projects, for instance, or we accept some uh, of risk and some reliability, if you especially go for a traditional way of contracting, and in some cases, design and build where some private uh, uh, preliminary information need to be provided at the uh, early stage. So now it's Q&A for everybody, and I will personally be happy to answer a question, as well as uh, Virginie is there to answer other questions from our participants uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, and Virginie, uh, this was a very uh, insightful, actually, presentation. I wouldn't say presentation, it was a lecture more on how to differentiate between these two uh, different system of law. Uh, let me ask you a question first. Uh, uh, actually, it came to my mind as well. So which is more pro proactive of contracts, contractors in your opinion? Is it the French or English law? Uh, the most protective. Uh, you, yeah, you yeah. Know. Uh, which is more protective. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I would think that um, uh, to the extent uh, that the rules are clear, and uh, it's not that English law has no clear rules, I don't, I don't want to say that, <laughs> uh, but uh, the fact that uh, they are more readily accessible, um, probably uh, French law provides a uh, um, uh, big round of uh, what uh, the contractor can expect uh, uh, to be liable for. And, um, and, and, uh, and also, um, there are certain uh, um, general principles that I mentioned, uh, such as, uh, for example, the principle of imprevision, uh, the principle of uh, force majeure, uh, which can apply and uh, in certain circumstances, it can be, uh, they can represent an escape for a contractor uh, where uh, the contractor is affected by a, a extraordinary situations that makes uh, his uh, uh, contractor performance difficult. So, uh, in fact, the difference I would see myself uh, uh, between the French and English uh, uh, system is that uh, if you do not have uh, a strong power of negotiation to negotiation to negotiate uh, uh, good contractual clauses in your favor. Um, yeah. Then probably French law um, might uh, protect uh, uh, better the the uh, position of the contractor. Okay. So uh, what about the subcontractors? Well, that's the similar uh, situation because, in fact, uh, in uh, under French law, there is a specific law uh, which was enacted in 1975, uh, which was uh, um, uh, conceived uh, for the purpose uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, protecting subcontractors uh, in situations where they were not paid, for example, by contractors as a result of uh, also of disputes uh, between the contractors and, uh, and the employer, for instance. Uh, and uh, according to that particular law, uh, the subcontractor can um, uh, go directly to the employer to get paid uh, for whatever um, works uh, that uh, the uh, subcontractor has uh, undertaken and completed or, or, and for which payment is uh, ordered. And uh, there is also um, a payment performance, uh, yep. a payment, sorry, bond that mm -hmm. is imposed on the contractor at the time of the conclusion of the contract so that uh, the subcontractor uh, can claim the nullity of the subcontract agreement if that payment bond is not issued. So in, in, in that, con that, for example, those kind of protections do, do not exist at all under English law. And in fact, we have seen uh, recently with, um, with the bankruptcy uh, uh, of Carillion uh, that uh, uh, many subcontractors have uh, uh, disappeared from the market uh, uh, because of uh, the difficulties and the lack of protections. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so let me ask Ahmed Quichel and come back to you again, uh, Virgie, because we have uh, Quichel comes uh, in relation to Qatar. Uh, yes. What does the Qatar Civil Code say uh, with regards to the ground risks? Uh, if it's the contractor's risk, like the French Civil Code, how much scope does Ajgal have to amend its contract? So well, I think well, I had can, sure, uh, You know, for sure, uh, we, we, the, the, the Qatar Civil Co uh, Code is similar to the French, uh, basically, and, or yeah. the Napoleon uh, law, basically, okay? Uh, but nonetheless, we at Ashgal try to bring some sort of uh, balance to our contracts, for instance. But I must admit, it's not really to satisfactory level, uh, uh, to the level of, let me say, FedEx standard, for instance, where uh, underground uh, physical conditions are properly shared and expressly stated the uh, risk allocations, for instance, under uh, FedEx. Uh, that's all what I can say for the time being, uh, to be honest. But uh, we are very much obliged to follow the other civil code in relation to many, many uh, yeah. other clauses, uh, you know, apart from uh, the other ground conditions. Yeah. yeah. I think it's all coming to the speaking about the allocate of the risk in construction contract. I think this is the whole. Uh, taking from the law and implementing it to, to the contract. Uh, I had another question to uh, um, Virginie. Actually, it's a big question from our friend Pramod. Uh, I'll try yeah. to, to read it. Um, so he speaks about, say, uh, isn't unforeseen ground conditions almost uh, always a risk or liability carried by the professional and experienced uh, contractor who must uh, emphasize or investigate uh, under their obligation the result in civil law um, or fitness for purpose in common law to consider this risk within limits, especially so in circumstances where the employer has allowed for contractor to make or would have deemed to have requested for uh, geotechnical investigation for uh, brown or green field projects, unless the contractor was strictly required to follow or rely on the design consultants uh, who has provided similar data. So prior to execution of construction contract, hence, isn't the risk carried by the contractor who had failed to manage an unforeseen, but nevertheless known risk, known, unknown? So I, I hope you understand the question. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a <laughs> well, long it's, question. Uh, <laughs> I, can, I can actually volunteer. Yeah, uh, um, Ramon is trying to make our that, life difficult. You know? <laughs> yeah, the, the problem here is uh, the one that actually Hamad was mentioning earlier. Uh, yeah. The fact is that uh, um, practically, uh, the issue is not anymore whether you uh, uh, have uh, French law or English law applying to the contract, because uh, typically what happens in most contra contracts that are signed today, concluded uh, uh, with uh, big employers, especially, uh, the liability and the risks uh, that derive from uh, the characteristics of the ground are pushed back to uh, push down to the yeah. contractors. 
and uh, you do not have any chance uh, to actually visit uh, or do or to, I mean, to perform any kind of survey or study. As our yeah. mother has explained, in fact, uh, these uh, uh, some of these projects that Ashkal has awarded to two contractors, the contractors had uh, not uh, uh, been uh, authorized to make any kind of uh, study to uh, to define what were the risks uh, relating to the ground conditions. And yep. when actually you disclose, you discover that there are major differences. Uh, uh, and, uh, and you have to cover the cost of these differences, you have inevit inevitably a major dispute. And uh, as you have said, as you have seen uh, with Ashkal, for example, these disputes have not been limited to one or two. <laughs> there are many, even though um, they have uh, done a very good, uh, excellent uh, effort in, uh, in defining the very best contracts uh, to apply to their as um, projects. The problem is uh, if you want to um, undermine uh, the fact, uh, I mean, the situation where you have contractors that at some point uh, stop working, it's a cost for the, uh, for the state. It's, um, the project does not go on, even if you are right, if the project stops and you have a dispute, it's an in, uh, in any event a cost for you. So, so even if, uh, exactly, so what I mean is that uh, under those, uh, if you look at these situations uh, um, broadly, it is in fact uh, the interest of uh, the uh, employer to invest in uh, trying to define the data relating to the ground as much as possible by using these new technologies. Okay. Because you uh, reduce the risk uh, of having disputes uh, later on. And uh, not only, but you can also uh, define uh, a better use for these, for these technologies to the extent that uh, the, uh, the margin of risk or unforeseeability, unforeseeability is reduced so much that uh, even in terms of cost, you have uh, a reduction of cost uh, uh, that uh, can be uh, the object uh, of a dispute between the employer and the contractor. And the problem is that uh, in order to accept this kind of new, this new approach, you need to have an employer that is uh, intelligent or modern enough to invest the money into these uh, preliminary studies. Yeah, yeah. And, so, so, uh, yeah, please continue. No, no, it's, uh, and, uh, and the problem is uh, that uh, um, this, uh, um, I mean, uh, psychology, this kind of um, new intellectual approach, uh, it's not uh, yet acquired because uh, um, still these, uh, some of these new technologies are not very well known. They are not very well uh, established. Sometimes uh, uh, what happens is that uh, the uh, projects are already quite costly. So yeah. uh, the uh, employer would uh, um, prefer to spend money pushing down the, uh, uh, the liability and, pay and, and spend the money in paying the projects. Yeah. And, um, and it's easier because in fact, uh, you know that there are some disputes that will come, but you don't know when and you don't know if they will be there. Uh, so for that reason, it looks, uh, it, 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 it sounds, uh, it appears as something very remote, very far away. So you prefer not to, to spend money right now uh, in order to prevent uh, those uh, disputes later on. Um, mm -hmm. But later, but I mean, um, at some point things will change. I don't know if uh, Hamad uh, has uh, any examples uh, that uh, uh, he can volunteer on this uh, with respect to these kind of issues. Uh, not really, to be honest, I can't recall of any, uh, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe, so, maybe some other time. Yeah. So uh, let, let me ask you, uh, Virginie, about, like, in your opinion, which party can best control this risk and the, its associated consequences? The risk of uh, ground conditions? Huh? Yes. Uh, well, if you... Are, um, if you are well positioned in your negotiation and you can have a favorable contract to you, probably under English law is better because you can negotiate whatever you want. 
But yeah. the problem is that if you are a contractor, probably you don't have that kind of power, uh, even if you choose uh, to have English law. Uh, but uh, if you have uh, uh, not that power, uh, probably under French law, you have uh, some escape tools uh, that I explained. So that uh, if you have indeed uh, foreseeable uh, grant conditions, you can escape uh, your liability because of the application of hardship, uh, of uh, force majeure, mm. um, and those are principles that are implied terms uh, ab absorbed uh, in the contract, uh, which a contractor can invoke uh, in order to um, terminate the contract uh, or to adapt the contract to um, excessive oner onerous uh, uh, conditions that makes uh, the performance difficult, excessively difficult for the contractor. So these are the uh, the um, the, uh, the solutions. Yeah. Okay. So another uh, question says, uh, if a subsoil report is provided by employer, does the risk allocation change in common law and Qatar civil law? What about the Najgal contracts? What about misrepresentations by the employer? So apart from it, it's, it's for you and the rest, I think it's for Mr. Ahmed. Uh, so the, the subsoil report is provided by the employer. Does the risk allocation change in common law and Qatar civil law? I think, yes, I think. We, have, we have seen that uh, in the cases, Obrasco case uh, and uh, in, in the uh, PBS uh, um, case uh, that I mentioned under English law, uh, yeah. the fact that you have a study provided by the employer does not allow the contractor to say that whatever is beyond what was uh, included in the study um, can be considered as unforeseeable. Uh, actually, English courts have established that, that uh, contractors must uh, consider the worst um, case scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, so whenever you are provided a study, uh, the quantities uh, uh, and the data provided uh, in those studies can be adjusted uh, yeah. quite broadly in order to make really an assessment of what are the risks and costs that you can incur if you are a contractor, okay? Uh, and what about the misrepresentation by the employer? Well, misrepresentation is a different thing. Uh, yeah. Misrepresentation uh, in, um, implies a fault, uh, implies a fraud, uh, and that, uh, um, uh, I mean, when there is a fraud and misrepresentation, uh, yeah. then uh, the, uh, the rules uh, change completely and, uh, and the liability also. Uh, so if you are able to, to share, to, to show that indeed there was a misrepresentation for the purpose of having the contractor to uh, uh, accept the contract, for instance, then you can probably um, uh, allocate the liability to the employer. Uh, okay. But I, I I cannot believe uh, that, uh, I mean, I, I hope that uh, misrepresentation can be demonstrated, but it's quite rare <laughs> to yeah, do so. Exactly. So, Ahmed, yeah. the, the question is brought from what about Ajgal contracts? Yeah, I may I just add to the statement, uh, if, the, if there was an intention on fraudulent misrepresentation, that would definitely end up in total mess and perhaps collapse of contracts. It's proven to be uh, fraudulent. Uh, but nonetheless, sometimes people with goodwill uh, express views or give some information with goodwill, but it happens to, 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 to be a, a kind of misrepresentation of, uh, afterwards. Anyway, uh, with Ashgal, uh, you know, under the uh, practice of Red Book, let me say, for instance, where the job is fully designed by the employer, uh, of course, we do hire uh, some specialized uh, consultant for you know, uh, soil investigations. Uh, we have many accredited laboratories in Qatar. We come up with those reports, and we rely on those reports to do our design work of any uh, substructure work, for instance, such as you know foundations and footings. Uh, this, in, in turn, obviously puts in our tender documents and put into the market, so contractors may not necessarily have the interest to go and investigate the sites based on. Uh, a job which uh, is basically fully designed by uh, the employer, so they would expect that the employer would accept fully other people. But unfortunately, 
if it happens uh, that there uh, was some design error, for instance, or uh, uh, some a bit of uncertainties or deficient uh, design, then uh, uh, the contractor is uh, required to handle the issues to rectify those errors or deficiencies and uh, come up with uh, solutions, unfortunately, at his own cost. Uh, now, this is a bit debatable, to be honest. Uh, if we classically follow the red book uh, and the public process, uh, then uh, it is definitely the liability of uh, the employer to compensate the contractor for uh, its errors. I mean, for the employer's uh, errors. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, no matter how many solid investigation reports we attach into our tender documents, we always come up with this standard statement, the contractor. Uh, must verify all the information and satisfy himself with all the information by checking, by you know, performing any rectifications and corrections afterwards. So thereafter, he held the other for any rectification was afterwards. Yeah. yeah. So we will take the last question. We have like a lot of questions, but we will take the last question because of our time. How is classified unforeseen items scattered for such as underground military defense security installations? Uh, the information is protected by the states. So how to unforeseen for that one? Oh, that's a very uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, um, the um, uh, case, uh, the Obraskan case, uh, the OHL Obraskan case uh, relating to the works uh, uh, for the uh, airport of Gibraltar, related to uh, some military, um, some contamination of the soil really, um, deriving from military actions uh, during the war. So it's not, it, it was not necessarily a, a secret, a state secret um, to some extent, but uh, um, for those uh, uh, kind of um, uh, um, aspects uh, that related to the ground conditions, uh, you can have the same kind of consequences uh, that uh, derive from the, the, the general cases. It's not because uh, they are from um, the, that, uh, the, um, the uh, risks uh, for, I mean, the characteristics of the ground derive from uh, military reasons uh, that uh, the, the, the rules change necessarily. So the allocation of risks and liability remain uh, uh, for contractors the same, unless there has been uh, any kind of negotiation, uh, specific negotiations for this uh, um, risk uh, in particular with the state. Yeah, okay, so, before, yeah. No, my impression is that uh, the rules do not really change. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you so much, Virgie. Before we close, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, two persons actually behind the scene. Uh, our committee member, uh, Nurul Sapri, who was uh, uh, very keen organizing this event, and also uh, Franco, uh, the head of administration, and he is the person who will be uh, handling all the uh, issues. If you have any question, please uh, uh, contact Franco for any information about the Charter Institute of Arbitrators in Qatar or for our upcoming course. I also encouraging uh, the attendees to uh, go and check uh, on our LinkedIn uh, uh, and follow us on the social media. And again, I would like to thank you, uh, Virginie, uh, for, for being here, for giving us this opportunity to learn from you and your time. And thanks, Ahmed, so much for, uh, for, uh, for inviting uh, Virginie to speak at uh, our webinar. Thank thanks you, for coming at Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you much. all, and look forward to seeing you again. By the way, Virginie is going to uh, be our guest for... Uh, uh, a second uh, webinar sometime in September, is that right? Yes, that is yeah. correct. <laughs> uh, Virginia will be back uh, with yeah. us in September. We have another event also for tomorrow uh, yes. for the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. So please, I think at the same time, Ahmed, seven o'clock. So, no, it's going to be uh, five o'clock. Uh, five o'clock yeah. Doha time. It's so please, a very difficult anyone... one, but interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. And thank yes. you so much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.